Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn before the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, for I have told you. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, this week um, in, in my study, and uh, of course, as we've We've done our, our Facebook series for those of you who have been able to follow along with that. And we walked through Jesus' uh, teachings on his own resurrection, on his own death and resurrection. Uh, scripture alone really became a key theme for me. Um, you know, you look at the scriptures and we bring, we bring all of our presuppositions, all of our beliefs, we, we bring our religion to the text when we read. And when we, when we read, it's really, really difficult uh, to, to read with pure eyes, the eyes of, the eyes of children. It's, it's really, really difficult for us to read that way. And so uh, we look at the, the text of Scripture, and we assume we know what a text of Scripture means. Uh, and we have this understanding that we come to the text with, and then uh, we begin uh, studying well the text of Scripture. We begin uh, practicing the principle of Scripture interprets Scripture. So you read in one place, and you, you go back and, and look at the context, and you read books as a whole to figure out what's actually being said, actually being written in the text of Scripture. And then there's that moment where what I am bringing to the text isn't quite fitting what the text says. And so there's that moment when we, we have to actually change our beliefs in response to Scripture. And it's this idea, um, Scripture alone. And uh, so we, we strive, um, and hopefully the most obvious way here at, here at the church at Sunsites, to, to present the text as the text was intended to be read as the text was intended by God to be presented so that you are not hearing the words of a preacher, the words of Andrew Cannon, but you're actually hearing the words of our only teacher according to the Gospel of Matthew, and that is, that is Jesus Christ. Um, that is so important. Uh, that is so important for us to get right. And so when it comes to understanding the resurrection, we go to, we go to Scripture to see what Jesus said about the resurrection, um, to look at the events as they're described by the gospel writers. And we, we just try to present this as honestly as possible. On Friday, we came together as a, as a church family. It was an, an intimate gathering. And we talked about the grief that Jesus experienced as he was on his way to the cross. Uh, he took on the grief and the sin of the whole world. This grief was caused by more more than just the, the prospect of a, of, a, of a brutal beating, a flogging, and then a crucifixion. Uh, it was actually, according to uh, Isaiah, the grief that comes from this burden of sin. And, and, and Christ was, was being imputed with our sin as we are being imputed with His righteousness. And, and when He died, He died once for all for the justification of His people. According to uh, the prophet Isaiah and according to Matthew, the gospel writer here, Jesus died on a cross for many. Particularly the elect, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. Today we we arrive at this passage of Scripture, the resurrection. 
Yesterday was, was Black Saturday. Symbolically, Jesus was in the grave during this time. And this morning, Sunday, Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, the day of Christ's resurrection, we get to celebrate Easter together. And the best way to celebrate Easter, man, is just to consider the words of our Lord. We're going to look at this passage here in Matthew chapter 28 in three parts. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll look at the importance of the Sabbath day. We'll see that in verse 1. And in verses uh, 2 and 3 and 4, we'll, we'll actually see that Jesus' teaching over the last three chapters is being fulfilled here on Sunday morning, on Resurrection Sunday. And then in verses 5 through 7, uh, we will just consider together the reality of the resurrection. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1 says this, Now after the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. After the Sabbath. These first key words are very, very important for us to consider, important for us to understand what the Sabbath was, what the Sabbath meant, and why it is important that Jesus rested on the Sabbath here just as God rested on the Sabbath after the creation of the world. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we see this amazing story unfold. Uh, God is creating the world. He, he creates the land and he creates the sea and he separates uh, the heavens from from the land and the seas on the earth and and God places plants in his creation and he and he places animals in his creation and and the creation account culminates with God placing his own image within his creation and, and he calls this image humanity man and then God completed everything that he was doing in creation. Let me just read this straight from the text. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and earth were completed, and all their hosts. And by the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God created and made. And so from the very beginning, the, the premise of all of Scripture, the opening chapters of, of the Bible, we see that this seventh day is sanctified and it is holy before God. This is why Joseph of Arimathea wanted to put Christ in the tomb before the Sabbath began because he wanted to be presented clean on, on the Sabbath. But here we see in Matthew chapter 28 in the, in the first verse, Matthew is sure to clarify it was after the Sabbath that Christ rose. It was after the Sabbath that the angel came and the tomb was empty. And so we see through Holy Week, through, through Passover, which is this week celebration leading up to this, this Sabbath day, the Jews are celebrating deliverance from captivity in Egypt. And Christ is, is preparing to give himself on, on the cross. And he, he spends Holy Week teaching about his own crucifixion and, and his own resurrection. And then on Friday morning, the, the day before the Sabbath, Christ is crucified on a Roman cross. The world there, they're watching. And I recognize that just as, just as God, in the story of creation, completed His creation before the Sabbath and then sanctified the Sabbath, made it holy, so did Christ do this, this work before the Sabbath. I want to read to you another verse of Scripture from uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse, verse 2. God is speaking with the, with the prophet Jeremiah. And he is about to, to tell Jeremiah, Ask, and I will reveal to you great and unsearchable things. But when God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah, God identifies himself. And he identifies himself as the Lord who created 
the earth in order to establish it. And so we see that even in the beginning, even in the Genesis chapters, this original state of creation, even in the Old Testament, God says very clearly for us, explicitly for us, that this is not the way that I want my creation to remain. This is, this is good. The state of creation, it is, it is, it is perfect. But I created this world in order to establish it according to the, the prophet Jeremiah. And that means simply this, that God created the world and the world exists and its, its state is, is, is good. But God himself has not yet clothed creation with his righteousness alone. And that's the point of this whole narrative in the Old Testament, right? That God would come to humanity by the law, show us that we are not good enough, that according to His standard we are actually unrighteous, to show us that we are not God, that our nature is not quite there. And so God gave the law in order to increase the trespass according to Romans chapter 5 and according to the book of Galatians and according to Deuteronomy there at the end of, at the, end of the law. God says, I want my righteousness to dwell upon my creation. I want my creation to be clothed in my righteousness. It is me alone who is to receive glory. And so we read this in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 2. God identifies himself as the, the Lord who created the earth in order to establish it. And then we get to the, the Gospels and we get to this story of Holy Week and, and Jesus is, is doing this thing in parallel fashion with, with the creation. Right? And on, even, even down to He's resting on the Sabbath after this work of establishing God's creation. So, so Jesus comes and in His crucifixion on Good Friday gives himself an atonement for sin, satisfying all of the conditions of the law with his life, and then also paying the price for sin in his death, accomplishes this work of establishing the creation of God within the righteousness of God. Easter means much more than just people now being able to come to, to Christ. This means something for all of creation. And it means something for all of humanity, especially those who believe in Jesus, for whom it means eternal life. And God is doing this work and has been doing this work from the creation of the world. And, and here on Easter Sunday, we celebrate not just the resurrection of the one we call Lord, but we celebrate that in Christ, all of creation is established within the righteousness of, of God. This is why Christ took on our, our, our sin. And we call this the great exchange, right? When Jesus hung upon the cross, He took our sin. We read this in the book of Isaiah on, on Friday. Jesus actually took our sin upon Himself, and He took our grief upon Himself, and He took our imperfections upon Himself. Our sin, the darkness in us, was placed on Jesus, and His righteousness was placed on, on us, His chosen people. And we call that the great exchange. There are many places, particularly on this day of the year, where um, people will teach something like, or they'll make this kind of, kind of statement, or maybe it's a, a Good Friday service and they're talking about the, the death of Christ, and they'll talk about the, the sky going dark, and, and they'll mention that, that Christ quotes from, from Psalm chapter 22, and, and they'll say something to the effect of, it's the only time that God ever forsook someone. Or they'll say, uh, God could not look on sin, and so he had to look away from Jesus. And I, I want to address this this morning. That sort of teaching most likely comes from Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, though the explicit wording can't be found anywhere in uh, Scripture, Old Testament or, 
or new. This teaching uh, most likely comes from Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. And this text is misrepresented, but I want to look at uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. We can pause for a second here. Sorry. I wasn't going to say any names. She could have just quietly turned it off and nobody would have known. I think the Holy Spirit might be calling. We better, we better answer. That's right. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. The, the prophet writes this, speaking of God and speaking to God, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Some translations there will just say you cannot look on wickedness. Why do you, the prophet writes, why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you uh, silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? And so this verse in the text of Scripture it clearly does not, does not speak to God's ability to see or to look in the direction of sin or darkness or, or evil. This verse in the, in the text of Scripture speaks to God's just nature. The fact that God cannot let sin, treachery, go. Restitution must be made because of God's just character. And in the prophets, we see that God promises just that, right? The restitution will be made. That all accounting will be given to to God through, through Christ. And here the prophet speaks of God's just nature. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And then he goes on to say, even though you are just, it sure seems to me like the wicked people are getting away with a lot of stuff, Lord. They swallow up those who seem to me to be righteous. God, why are you letting this happen? How many of us have asked the same question that the prophet asks? Yes. Yes, we do. But this is what the prophet is, is getting at here. And in the Gospels, as we read, as we get to Matthew chapter 28, God gives his answer. He gives his answer through the teaching and the testimony of, of Jesus Christ, where Christ says, I am taking the sins of the world upon myself. Retribution will be paid on the cross so that I can forgive people of their sin and their evil and their treachery against God. And so we see in Scripture that God has a just nature. But God, we cannot say that He is unable to look in the direction of sin and at the same time say that He took the sins of the world upon Himself, that would be a contradiction. And so the Scriptures speak profoundly about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, verse 21 would say this, He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of of God. This is the story of the crucifixion and, and the resurrection. And so if you have sin in your life, do not fear. God still sees. God can still look in your direction. In fact, Christ has taken that very sin upon himself at Calvary on the, on the cross. On the cross. Next, we arrive at verses 2 through 5. And we see that Jesus' teaching in the previous three chapters, it is, it is fulfilled. And Matthew is recording this as being fulfilled, that Christ is who He says He is, and Christ has been given all authority. And we will walk through this briefly here. But first, let's read again verses 2 through 4. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now leading up to this in the, in the previous three chapters, and we'll walk through some instances, Jesus is, is teaching about some, 
some crazy things that are going to happen when he is, when he is killed, crucified, and then when he, when he comes in, in his glory with all authority. And here, Matthew begins, begins to write of some of these signs taking, taking place. And we'll start in chapter 24. And we won't, we won't read chapters 24 through, through 27. Um, that might take too much time, but I just want to mention some key points. Uh, if you want to see um, those verses uh, explained, uh, there are some short videos on the church Facebook page um, and, on, and, on my, and on my blog if you would like to see these in more detail. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples ask, Lord, Jesus, teacher, what will be the sign of your coming? And when will the end be? <laughs> and in chapter 24, verses 4 through 8, Jesus, he answers their question, but maybe not in the way that they would expect. Of course, Jesus did that often. Jesus describes some natural disasters, and he describes some human conflicts, and he stated that these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs on, on the earth. He also reminded his disciples not to let anyone mislead them. There would be many false prophets. And this, brothers and sisters, is, is the reason it's, it's so important for us to always go back to the scriptures and to always look at context uh, to be sure that what we are hearing and what we are seeing is actually the Word of God and not some religious thing that people are bringing to the text and trying to explain the text in a way that is very un, ungodly or in a way that is misleading. Jesus actually warns that there will be not just a few, but many false prophets. In chapter 24, verses 9 through 14, Jesus teaches his disciples that they will be delivered over, killed, and hated, and that lawlessness will increase. And he, he referred to this, speaking to his disciples, as tribulation for them. Of course, we know that almost all of the disciples were martyred, right? They experienced this very tribulation that Jesus was referring to. He stated that the gospel would be preached to every nation during this tribulation, and then the end would come. In chapter 24, verses 15 through 25, Jesus continues to describe this great tribulation, and this time he uses the accent word, great. You see that in verse 21 in chapter 24. And he applies these signs by telling his disciples to be sure that no one misleads them. There it is again. Be sure that no one misleads you, disciples. There are many false prophets. False prophets will try anything to mislead, if possible. And you can see this in verse 24 there in Matthew 24. If possible, even to mislead the elect. And this is why we are so dedicated to Scripture alone. And why we want to teach the Scriptures alone without, without trying to bring in our, our religious presuppositions or, or, our, or our opinions or our, or our traditions. Because this is the only way that we can be sure that we're not being misled. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 26 through 35, Jesus describes what will happen after the tribulation. The sky would go dark, and the powers of the heavens would be shaken. At this time, the, the Son of Man would come on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, sending forth His messengers, some translations will say angels, to gather together His elect from the whole earth. The, the generation of disciples, he said in verse 34, that was present before him, this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And that was the generation of people standing there before him. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 51, Jesus instructs that since the exact day and hour of his own coming is unknown, the people of God should be on alert and should be about the Master's business in all matters. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 30, Jesus would tell two parables, one about His coming crucifixion, the parable is future tense, and one about the continuous state of affairs in this world, the parable is presented in present tense in Jesus' time. And He did this in order to illustrate His teaching through chapter 24. In chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, Jesus 
described the, the work that he would be doing when he comes in his glory. He would be observing the nations and he would be separating out his people from the people who are not his. And God's people would remain with him and the accursed would depart from him into an eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, Jesus finishes these words and tells his disciples that he would be handed over for crucifixion. And so we see in chapter 26 that Jesus' crucifixion is directly connected to these teachings. Jesus finishes these words and it says, Disciples, it's happening in, in a couple days. In a couple days, Passover will begin. And then shortly after that, though no one knows the exact day or hour, I will be handed over for crucifixion. Chapter 26, verse 6, through chapter 27, verse 44, the disciples begin to experience great human conflict. These things are coming to pass. Jesus is handed over for crucifixion, and He is placed on a cross. Chapter 27, verses 45 through 66, at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion, the sky goes dark. The sun stops shining. The moon is covered up. Stars fall from the sky. The sky goes dark. And the powers of the heavens were shaken. The veil in the temple was torn in two. The powers of the heavens were shaken just as Jesus had predicted. He was coming at this point, Good Friday, in all of His glory. In chapter 28 verses 1 through 20, the chapter we are in this morning, Jesus is raised from the dead and he claims all authority. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. And he is sending his messengers out to gather the elect from the earth. And we see that Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20. We know that is the great commission. The, the reality of Easter, brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ has all authority. Jesus Christ has all glory. Jesus Christ sits on His throne. And Jesus Christ sends out His disciples, His messengers, to proclaim His message, Scripture alone. There it is, the theme again. Scripture alone, His words alone, to preach His word to the nations. For us, we, we begin in our own community. We preach the Scriptures alone. This is what Jesus says in context. This is the way that this is to be received. This is the correct teaching of, of this text. And this is the right application of this text in our lives. Jesus is sending out His messengers, His people, for the purpose of gathering His elect, those people that He has chosen, according to Matthew chapter 24. This is the work that Christ is currently doing. And it's not some far-off thing according to the text of Scripture. Or sometimes we read into it and we let our the theology color the text of Scripture, which is actually a very dangerous thing for us to do, right? But the message of Easter, the way it is presented by, by Jesus and in the instructions that Jesus gives is, I'm doing this. It's now. I'm doing this imminently. My people, get to work. Be about the Master's business. Preach this message. Proclaim this message and nothing else. And through your preaching, through your sharing of my message, God's message alone, Christ is our only teacher, remember, through the sharing of this message, I am calling my elect to myself and I am separating the sheep from the goats. That is the message of Jesus. And it seems to be a current occurrence. Lastly, we'll consider the reality of the resurrection. Verses 5 through, through 7 here. The angel, in this case, actually meaning heavenly angel and not just messenger. The word angel, angelos, could mean angel. It's a word that literally means messenger, and angels are messengers from heaven. So when you see the word angel in the text of Scripture, we look at the context to discover whether... You know, it's actually an angel from heaven. Or whether, whether the word simply means messenger. The angel said to the woman, 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, this is the fulfillment of everything that Jesus was teaching. Just as he said, Jesus has risen from, from the dead. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So after Jesus' resurrection, this angel, this messenger, comes. And this messenger tells the women who have run to the tomb, right, to check on Jesus. He tells them, he, he is not here. Jesus is not here. And then this angel gives, gives this instruction to the women. Well, go tell his disciples. Go and tell his disciples. Go and proclaim this good news to the disciples of Jesus Christ. Later in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus himself, he, he, he met his disciples in Galilee. He's now on the mountain. He's about to ascend into heaven. And, and, and Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go proclaim this message, the message of the word of, of God. This is a work that Christ is currently doing. And Christ's resurrection means for us practice evangelism. Go preach this word, the word that I have given you. Preach it fully and completely. I gave you every word because I want you to proclaim every word. That's why here we walk through the scriptures, right? Jesus, Jesus gives this command. And we call it the Great Commission. He is sending His messengers into the whole world so that through His message proclaimed, through His messengers, He would call His chosen people to Himself. To himself. I want to take a moment and, uh, and just invite those who are not normally with us. Come and be a part of what Christ is, is doing through the proclamation of His Word alone. Here at the church at Sunsites. I mean, if, if Christ is, is calling you, first, like, the important thing is submit to Christ. Willfully come to Christ and say, Christ, be the Lord of my life, and I'm going to follow you in everything that I do, and I'm going to, to give my life willingly over to you. Lord, Lord Jesus, please take this as, as an offering to you. I don't, I don't have anything to bring, but Lord, please take my life. God in His grace and in His mercy promises that anyone who does that will be saved. That's a promise in the text of Scripture. But Christ isn't done. There's still tribulation, which means the end has not come yet, according to Jesus. It means that there's still this mission going and telling and it means that Christ is still separating the sheep from the, from the goats in our current age. It means that God's people, His messengers, are to be about the Father's business. Go and proclaim this message. And we do this by being a part of a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. Being involved in the ministry of the Word here at the church in some way, practicing the gifts that God has given us for service in His kingdom. And we make it really easy to share the message of Christ here, right? Especially like on social media, all you got to do is hit the share button. <laughs> like it's that easy, you know? And no matter who's preaching, no matter what is shared, we share the genuine message of Scripture. Christ is our only teacher. That means it doesn't matter who the mouthpiece is, as long as the Word of God is being proclaimed. This is the business we are to be about, the Father's business. And we get so caught up in our own business. We get so caught up doing the things that we want to do. We get so caught up just 
trying to get our lives to work. Have you ever known anybody that's just trying to get their life to work out by going to church? And then their life never, see, they can't get, still can't get their life together and they decide, oh, church doesn't work. It's because it's not the point of church. The point of church is that we would bring, bring ourselves as a, an offering, a living sacrifice before our Lord. That's, that's what worship is. So we present ourselves to the God who saves. And we concern ourselves with the Father's business. Not trying to satisfy our own desires or, or, or whatever by human religion or human relationships or human status. God may give some of those things as a gift, but understand it's all by His grace. Everything. Let us be about the Father's business here. This is the message of Easter. That we would recognize Christ's authority in the resurrection over sin and over death and over our lives and over creation itself. And just give ourselves wholly to the business of the Master.